All right, guys, and welcome back. If uh, you're watching this, it's because you want to learn something about the late 1800s in terms of factory work and city life. So pay close attention to those terms right there. Industrialization and urbanization. Those are the two hits you're going to be really looking for, especially in terms of vocabulary. So let's get it going, all right? First of all, ur urbanization is simple. It is the mass move. That means lots of people are moving from farms to the cities, right? We'll give you a couple reasons why in a minute, but think about urban, urban centers, right? From farms to cities, rural areas to cities. Well, what's going on? The cities offer a bunch of things. The biggest one in which is jobs in the new factories in the late 1800s. Also, uh, the cities began to provide transportation for people, even those who lived outside the city, to make their way back into the city. There were other things like uh, the city offered a much livelier lifestyle and uh, people were being displaced on a farm. So there's tons of other reasons, but the biggest one is simply what? Jobs in factories. That's why people are moving to urban centers was the word urbanization, right? So if we keep going, obviously a nice picture right there. That's New York City. You have tons of people living in a very small place. And we'll take a look at these tenement homes in a minute as we keep rolling. If you need to pause that to get that urbanization vocabulary, go ahead. I'm going to keep going here. There are a bunch of negative effects of city growth. So we're going to look at positive effects in a minute. But the first thing we're going to look at is the, the ugly thing, and that is housing. You have a lot of people living in a very small place. So what you have happen is you have unsanitary, crowded living conditions. Lots of people, small tenement homes, right? Uh, decent housing wasn't really available as the cities grew. They just grew too fast. Too many people uh, were moving to cities at a very quick pace. So most of the city is going to be filled up with these multifamily buildings called tenements. So you have a lot of people living in a very small area, sometimes two or three families living in a one-room tenement, all right? Uh, as you can imagine, with more and more people, crime will flourish, and these areas were known as the slums, right? They were very poor areas in cities, right? So that kind of gives you an idea of a one-room tenement. You got your bed, you got your stove over here. I know it's a dark picture, you can't see. Dirt, filth all over the place. It's just it's pretty bad, right? Uh, and these are your kind of medical workers and police to come around and check out uh, an area that actually it's actually a crime scene that they're looking at in this picture, but you can kind of get the uh, get the effect of that. Let's talk about people's health, all right, as they're living in these large cities. Urban crowding helps spread disease. You got a lot of people, small places, things happen, right? The water and sanitation were not really adequate for the amount of people. So the water people were drinking was tainted, and there was some, some places didn't even have bathrooms. So people went to the bathroom, and that, that stuff got into the water, and people were breathing it. So what happened? People got sick. The other issue with, uh, with public health at this time would be the real poor families really couldn't afford to eat the proper foods to stay healthy. So a variety of diseases popped up around this time period, and that is uh, the typical diseases you'd find is typhoid fever, dysentery, and cholera. Now, if you think about these diseases today, you don't really see people having these things today because we live a lot cleaner than we did in the late 1800s. So famous picture here, love it. You have the kids playing in this little gutter. They're playing next to a dead horse. I know if you're in my class, we, we looked at this. That's really not healthy. I can tell you right now, every one of those kids is probably going to get sick. Okay. Uh, the last other negative effect is uh, the people who are in control of the local governments uh, the mayor of New York City, the mayor of Chicago, the mayor of Cleveland, uh, these politicians really didn't do enough to fix the problems. And really what they were only looking for was to benefit themselves in terms of their finances to make more money. So they developed something called a political machine. I'll define that for you in a minute. All right. So the political machines or one political group took control of the city's governments at all levels. Right. And what they did, these political machines, they did various things to help poor people and to help these immigrants. They gave them jobs. They found them places to live. So these poor, uneducated people said, hey, you know, that guy's a good guy. I'm going to vote for that guy again. So the poor actually continued to vote for them. But behind the scenes, what were these politicians doing? A ton of corruption. Right. And uh, the, the word for this is graft. So these these mayors and I'll give you one example of New York City. He used his job 
to line his own pockets. He was basically stealing public money. And no one you know, at the beginning really didn't know about it because you had all these people and it was chaotic, but the mayor looked good, so he must be doing a good job, right? So one of the famous uh, grafters or corrupt politicians would be the mayor of New York City. His name was Boss Tweed. His actual name was William Marcy Tweed. They just called him Boss Tweed. And Tammany Hall was the, the Democratic headquarters in New York City. And this famous cartoon by Thomas Nass was, hey, you know, which one of you corrupt politicians is stealing government money? And, of course, this guy's saying, well, it wasn't me. It was this guy. This guy says, not me. It's him. This is actually Boss Tweed. He said, not me. It was this guy. Well, you know, who stole the people's money? Well, when you look at it, guess what? They all did. And they're all going to tell you it was somebody else, all right? So if you need that uh, vocab for a political machine, check that out. But you might want to remember William Marcy Tweed of New York City. He was a very corrupt politician. We'll, we'll dive deep into him, but his, uh, his livelihood in terms of our classroom, right? Uh, there are some good things that happen in terms of city. So we'll take a quick peek at the positive effects of city growth. And that is you have a ton of new technologies that come out. So well, what's new in terms of transportation? Some Subways, elevated trains, streetcars. So we call this uh, mass transit. We'll really be able to move people around. Um, we're building these large buildings now because we had steel. Uh, and along with these large buildings, what else develops? You had to get people up to the 48th floor. So you built an elevator, right? Elijah Graves Otis built the elevator, right? We did have safer city streets because we began using less gas and we began using uh, more electric lights, all right? Uh, you know, the old way was uh, where we had kerosene lamps. Well, kerosene lamps, if they break, it causes fire. So we began using uh, mostly electric lights in these, uh, on these city streets. And the health issues are simple. We, we needed to clean up the water, get a new water supply, make sure it was safe for people to drink, and set up some type of sanitary sewers so that people are able to go to the bathroom and it doesn't get into the, the drinking water. So along with the negative, we, we talk about some positive, and there, there's plenty more to go along with that. So uh, this I know I showed you in my class, if you were in there, this is the Brooklyn Bridge, the first steel suspension bridge still there today go see the brooklyn bridge go check it out right there is an elevator so elijah otis creates the elevator people get in they go up floors they go down floors it had a safety break on the bottom so if that cable up here broke that wouldn't plummet to, to your death so that's really nice uh there's different cultural changes that that do happen because of all these people. So uh, you did have public and private money. Uh, the government did take public money to build certain things for people. And also uh, there were private donations, the philanthropists, the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers. So what do we have here? You have new museums, concert halls, theaters, public parks. Uh, you may remember I showed you a picture of uh, Central Park, uh, the Olmsted Park system develops during the late 1800s. Uh, you had the uh, printing presses were really humming. More and more people could read, so you had these mass circulated newspapers. Everybody was reading the same stories, as well as the same magazines, as well as the same novels. So you had this kind of mass culture develop where everybody's reading the same things. And then you're going to end up with reformers. What are reformers? People who find the, the things that are not so good in society and say, hey, we're going to fix them. And John Dewey implemented solid techniques to change our, the quality of teaching people were getting in the late 1800s. More and more people can read, so more and more people were buying these sorts of uh, mediums to get their information. All right. Uh, there's obviously a book about who, William Marcy uh, Tweed, Boss Tweed, right, Mark Twain. Uh, it's about the Gilded Age, the uh, late 1800s. And uh, Horatio Alger, if you forgot him, he wrote those rags to riches stories. If you work hard, you can get rich and you could, uh, you could become somebody. And uh, by the way, those rags to riches novels encouraged immigration. Don't forget that, right? Let's talk about changes in our communities. This would be local things that, that happened that benefited communities. So... Usually uh, the, the positive changes are going to help not at the national level, but at a local level. They start really small. So reformers are going to create groups to correct certain problems in society. So what you find here is public money began to be used to improve services. So what are services? Those are things that the public uses. We call it really the civil services today. What are those things? Well, local hospitals, police force, and eventually fire departments in big cities. 
before this time period, there were no fire uh, houses. There were no actual paid firefighters. So if a building starts to burn down and no one's willing to put it out, it simply just burns. Okay. Uh, a huge reformer in Chicago was Jane Adams. All right, double D, Jane Adams. Uh, she led the settlement house movement, and these began to pop up in other major cities besides Chicago. Settlement houses were really cool places for immigrants to go so that their kids could learn American ways. Settlement houses allowed people to stay there for a certain period of time, maybe even help find employment, help you learn English. Really was an easy way for immigrant groups to come in and get their start in America. So what do they do? They provided education and services to poor people. All right. There she is. She's a great woman, really nice woman, Jane Adams. Don't forget her. All right. So now we're going to begin talking about who's living in the cities, right? And that's kind of like some of the work that the girls are doing in settlement houses, learning American ways, kind of dressing more American, so you see that. And if you need that vocabulary for the settlement house, you can pause that set slide so you have it. Let's talk about who's living in the city, all right? And really there's three broad groups, right? First of all, you have the, the lowest of the low. The working classes and uh, the poor people, all right? These are, tend to be your, uh, your immigrant groups here. Uh, there was a, a rising middle class at this time. It wasn't huge, but it was there. And then, uh, yeah, very few, but you did have some very wealthy. Um, these are your, your, your John D. Rockefellers and your Andrew Carnegie's and your Jay Goulds. These people lived in the mansions. We don't really need to read about them. We kind of know how they live, but we're more concerned about what can the government and what could uh, reformers do for this group of people here. So let's get it going. Let's look at the life of the working class, right? Uh, they were the largest group in the cities who lived in the dirtiest of places, the tenement homes or the slums. Some lived in company towns, uh, and if you need to know what that are, you might want to look that up, but uh, I haven't found that lately on the exam, so we're going to let that one go. Uh, they didn't have a lot of time. They did not have a lot of money to enjoy the extras. They were barely surviving, so they did not go to the theaters or the museums. They didn't enjoy leisure activities. These are the people that are working 12 hours a day. Six days a week, and uh, basically they get Sunday to themselves, and they're back to work, okay? So that's your, your working or, or poor classes, right? These are your sweatshop workers, your women, 12 hours a day, six days a week, terrible life, right? So uh, slightly above that would be a group we call the middle class, right? And these are going to be your skilled laborers. Doctors, lawyers, office workers, maybe even your secretaries. These are not the people working in the factories, all right? Uh, they had more space. They did enjoy some better housing. They weren't living in those tenement homes. They had a little extra money to enjoy some of their leisure time, maybe go to the theater. And uh, the types of things they did were, were fairly inexpensive but consumed a lot of time, like going to concerts, football and baseball games, enjoying the new uh, sports that were being created at that time. Their kids actually went to college and, once again, will be hopefully part of that middle class again. Uh, that is a typical middle class family. Notice they still had a lot of children. All right? A lot of the families at this time still had a lot of children. Right? The wealthy are going to be your easiest. Right? Smallest segment of urban life and living in the cities. They lived in the huge homes we would call mansions or, or even maybe like a, a large elegant apartment at the top of an apartment complex. They had extra money, so they contributed to charities and other charities and other cultural institutions, and they enjoyed the broadest range of city life. Why? They had the money, they had the cash to enjoy that time and spend it how they wanted to. Lavish dinners, going to all the sporting events, and those sorts of things. So I don't think we got to worry about the uh, the wealthy. That's Andrew Carnegie, one of the wealthiest men in America in the late 1800s. And that there, that that beast right there with that stash is J. P. Morgan. He would buy Carnegie's steel and turn it into U.S. steel, America's first billion-dollar-a-year enterprise. So J.P. Morgan um, and uh, John D. Rockefeller, they belong with the wealthy for sure, right? So let's talk about some changes for women, family structure, working classes in the late 1800s. What we do know is that more and more women began working outside the home. They began leaving the home and getting jobs mostly because their family needed them to work so they could, uh, you know, make enough money to survive. Uh, why did they do that? Provided that added income, a little extra money, but it also produced dress for the family. You just lost the homemaker. You lost the glue in the home. So the, the family as a structure is going to be a little disintegrated. The new jobs for women in the late 1800s, women 
predominantly have jobs as school teachers. They definitely work in factories. Uh, but a step up from that would be uh, maybe a secretary here or in the telephone as a telephone operator. Those were women jobs, right? Um, against public approval, women actually began entering certain fields that were traditionally only for men such as doctors and lawyers. Nursing was a job that was open to women, but doctors is a no-no. But against public approval, some women pushed the envelope and it began doing that. Well, what are the effects? Well, I'll just give you the numbers. 1880 to 1910, late 1800s, early 1900s, women workers jumped from 2.6 million to 7 million workers. So, I mean, the numbers are pretty clear. More and more women entered the workforce, all right? The conditions they encountered, though, not so good, right? Uh, there was hostility because, once again, society said, where were women supposed to stay? And if you're thinking about the home, you're correct. Uh, there were laws barring them from gaining certain jobs in the late 18, early 1900s. And some of that will not change until the 1960s, 1970s, right? Uh, if a woman was doing the same job as a man, she got less pay. And it was substantially, uh, substantially less. I mean, sometimes up to 50% less. So if I'm a factory owner and I know that I can pay a woman half the wages... What, in fact, your owners do. They, they hired a, a lot of these women, right? Women felt they needed one thing to make this change, and that is suffrage. And if you forgot the term suffrage, it's simply the right to vote. Uh, so, I mean, you should just have an idea of what women are doing in the late 1800s. The other group's workers are going to experience pretty much the same thing. So employers discriminated against African Americans and older workers and the disabled simply because this group of people couldn't keep up and there were certain racist attitudes in the late 1800s towards African Americans. Um, the other big issue that we'll deal with in the progressive era is there were, weren't any laws that protected children from bad working conditions. So kids were hired as well, just like women were hired. But why? Because you could pay them less money. So that should give you a quick hit on life in the late 1800s in terms of the city and industrialization. So don't forget that word, industry, factory, urban, city. Hope that helped you out, and uh, be prepared for the next video as it's coming shortly. Thanks, guys.